Hi, and welcome to Terribly Fun and Film. And we are back with another Seeking Asylum review. Yes, this does mean we're getting two reviews this week, as Dragon Con Countdown will still happen on its regularly scheduled Friday. But, the Asylum just released their third animated movie, Cargo. Watched it last night, and I absolutely need to talk about it. It's insane. It's insane. It comes from director James Colin Brezik, who is a horror director who's done things like uh, Pernicious and Blood Lake and uh, 13, 13, 13, two of those films being other Asylum titles, and yet somehow I have yet to review any of the movies he's directed, which just doesn't seem like that's possible through just sheer law of averages, but I haven't. Uh, he also had the horror movie Bethany get released earlier this year, and that is actually an upcoming review, so I find it amusing that this one's getting out before that one, despite me seeing that movie first. Anyway, Cargo comes to us from Gordon Brezek, James Colin Brezek's dad. Gordon Brezek was one of the main writers for Pinky and the Brain. No joke. No lie, he wrote several, several episodes of Pinky and the Brain. If that doesn't prepare you for all the insanity I'm about to discuss, I don't know what will. Without further review, this is the Seeking Asylum's review of Cargo. Cargo takes place in the titular town of Cargo. In it, the, we have a character named Danny. He's the smartest student in his class, but he feels unfulfilled in life. So his best friend, Vin, convinces him to start street racing. Street racing is illegal in Cargo, and this ends up accidentally getting Danny's dad total and sent to Clunker Island. Which is just what it sounds. Clunker Island is where once the cars become junkified and no longer good for anything but haven't actually died off yet, they get sent to this island to be cannibalized by other cars. Not kidding. Cannibalization of cars happens in this movie about cars. Ah, oh, it's so weird. And then the plot sees Danny and his other best friend, Cabigail. Uh, attempt to find various ways to get to Conquer Island. That's kind of it for the plot. Um, again, I don't really try to spoil things, but it's insane. So, first things first, going into the film is... It's a musical. I didn't know this when I bought the movie. had no idea. It is a musical. And the first four or five songs are just in a row. Oh... Uh, so, we have an opening song number introducing us to the world uh, that the movie takes place in. Then, uh, there's a short sequence and then another song. Then, another short dialogue sequence. Then, a song. And then, there's probably a good 30 to 40 minutes with no song. And then, the ending bit kind of picks up with more songs uh, again. So, there's a stretch there with no songs. So, I think they kind of front and back it loaded it a little too much in that regard, uh, basing it out. Although, to be fair, in terms of the story being told, I'm not sure where you would fit a song in at a car demolition derby in which our two main characters are dressed up as characters from William Shakespeare's Chromeo and Juliet. No, I'm not joking. I didn't make that up. That's an actual thing that happens in this movie. If you can tell me where to fit a song within that, by all means, go ahead and write one. Insert it into the film. I will make an addendum to this review here. But I grant that that, that time span where there are no songs is... They don't... It's hard to find a place for them. But it is a bit jarring that we go from a lot of songs to no songs for the longest time, then back to an average amount of songs, if you will. That's probably my biggest gripe in terms of the writings. Most of the songs are actually pretty good. 
fairly catchy. My favorite song is when our main characters first get to Clunker Island and the Mad Max looking insane cars who want to strip off, destroy, and then kill our main characters sing a song about just doing that. And it's a really good song. It's really catchy. It's really well sung. It's really well filmed. It's a lot of fun. In terms of the characterizations and that sort of thing, everybody has a specific kind of character. Ben is a friend of Danny's, but he's also kind of looking out for himself, so he abandons Danny at an important part of the story and leaves Danny to fend on his own, and that does not go well. Uh, so it's kind of simple, but this is an animated movie, very much for kids, and I think in that regard, the filmmakers do a good job. Each character feels realistic enough. They all at least have a small arc, excluding Danny, who of course has the biggest arc in the story. Uh, and everybody feels relatable, so that works. There are some really clever lines here too that I laughed at, and maybe I shouldn't have. Shouldn't have given these puns power, but I did. But there are also some really awkward lines that do not work as intended. Um, when we meet Don Carlone. Yeah, yeah, there's a mob boss subplot in this movie. Um, there's this really funny sequence with the two henchmen. One of the henchmen goes, we never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever hear the word no. And the other henchman goes, what's that even mean? No, seriously, I'm asking uh, for a friend. What does that even mean? And it's pretty funny. It's The guy had so many, the, the first henchman had so many nevers and devers and weirdness to that line that all meaning gets lost. You then instantly address it, and it's really funny. Only for the Don to pop up, and... I guess it was meant to be a pun. I don't know. It was a little bit weird. Instantly following that, though, Danny agrees to the terms and conditions of what the Don is offering him, and says, you may be an offer I can't refuse. The Don goes, hmm, an offer you can't refuse. I like that. Mind if I use that sometime? And Danny's like, sure! That's humorous. That's the kind of crazy peeking in the brain lines that I like. Um, some of the dialogue, though, does not work. Uh, in order for them to dress up and get to the demolition derby, because again, they are dressed up as Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet in this car world. Uh, they actually have to go on stage and perform certain scenes from it. And the audience reactions are things like, Oh, I always found William Shakespeare boring before. Um, sorry, what's his name? Uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Boring before. Those don't work. They, they feel unnecessary to everything. And it's just, it's not humorous. It doesn't really add anything to the scene. It's awkward there. But I would say most of the time, between the strong characterizations and the really funny one I understand, the mostly really good songs, the writing definitely works way more often than it doesn't. As for the directing, this is easily, without a doubt, the most self-assured, engaging, and uh, confidently directed animated movie the Asylum has produced. I've reviewed their first one, It's His Way Home, and I found it to be perfectly okay. It's not great not amazing. It was alright. It's a good first step in the anime world. Decent characterization. Cute story. Kids love it. Adults might be kind of bored. It has a shockingly great turn from Joey Fatone as a sea cucumber. I did not review Trollland, their second animated movie, because I'm still not sure it was meant to be released. I don't think that movie got finished. In terms of the animation quality, the texture, the rendering, just plain editing and scene transition, it is such a step backwards from even just Izzy's Way Home that it's weird. This movie, though, has a lot of roving cameras, 
cameras following characters uh, when they're moving moving down roads or that sort of thing. Really great texture uh, textures and lighting for an uh, independently made animated film. And because of that, there's, there's an energy here, even during uh, uh, there's a nice energy during the race sequences, during the demolition derby, during the song numbers that just comes across every single sequence. And while there may be a few moments where the editing's iffy, um, I think the way the camera moves, the way we're introduced to the world, the way we keep everything on track action-wise overcomes that occasional misstep to be really engaging and just plain interesting in a totally weird way because as I mentioned this is a movie that's musical that has a number about cars looking like they're straight out of Mad Max films wanting to cannibalize other cars. God bless the asylum. I've never seen anything like this, people. It's... It's hypnotic. It's hypnotically strange. There are moments, animation-wise, where the car's lip movements don't 100% sync up to what is being said. There's a like a 0.2 second delay sometimes, or maybe the lips are a little too fast or something like that. But, compared to their other two films, it actually works way better than it has in those two films. Probably the main character of Danny is Haley Joel Osment, and he's really good. He imbues the character with a lot of heart and uh, that sort of ill-defined, I don't know what I want out of life thing in these sorts of coming of age stories works well here. He brings a lot of empathy because he's a good student. He does have friends. He just doesn't know if he wants his dad's life. His dad wants him to be the mechanic and take over the shop when his dad retires. Um, and he doesn't know if he wants that. So Street Racing allows him to sort of get out his frustrations. But then there's the cop, Freddy Cop Car. Literally his last name is Cop Car and he's a cop car. <laughs> And he has speech haps all over, so he always knows when a race is happening. And uh, so now he has to deal with that and getting into trouble and all that. And um, he makes you like the character. The character never gets too whiny, too obnoxious, or anything like that. And he could have. There's definitely an alternate reality from where we're. It's not Haley Joel Osment as that character, and somebody just hates the character so much. Because he's just kind of an insufferable little prick who just doesn't know what he wants. Uh, but. Thanks to strong writing and really strong voice acting, that's not the case here. The character feels relatable, and I think little kids will like him a lot. As Danny's best female friend, Cabigail, Melissa Joan Hart is really good. She gets a lot of mileage out of her longing for Danny, but Danny doesn't really see her that way stuff. And I think her and Haley Joel work well off of each other. I know that usually when you're doing voice acting you're recorded separately from everybody else but it still works it sounds like they're playing off of each other and stuff and that's important especially to an animated movie as Danny's other friend Vin his name is Vincent Diesel his full name is Vincent Diesel just so you know what we're dealing with here is Jason Mewes and it's 100% Jason Mewes there's no mistaking it there's no thinking it's somebody else. It's just Jason Mewes. We know it's Jason Mewes. But I really like Jason Mewes. Jason Mewes is funny and fun. And he's funny and fun here. And I'm glad it was him. Playing Danny's dad is Ed Asner. No, I'm not joking. You... It's Ed Asner playing a car dad. So it's basically Paul Newman's character from the first Cars, only Ed Asner. And he's really good. He gives my favorite performance in the film. He's stern, yet you do feel his love for his son, and that sort of thing doesn't feel overplayed, and it does work in context, despite being such a well-worn trope. I mentioned the mob boss earlier. Playing him is the director, James Colin Brezek, and he has a really amusing mob impersonation, a sort of uh, soft Marlon Brando, if you will. 
and it works. The lines are funny, and he laughs when appropriate, and it's an enjoyable performance. Bill Lamar plays the police chief along with the character of Speedy Fireball and the Demolition Derby announcer. And I really like Phil, Phil Lamar. Phil Lamar has several voices on several different shows throughout probably every universe known to man, including Futurama. He was a mainstay of Mad TV for years, and he's a really funny dude. I like him a lot, and I think he does a really good job here, especially as Fred Kopkar. Uh, there's a really great joke at the end involving the character. That's a lot of fun. When we get to Clucker Island, we of course meet the natives of Clucker Island. They have a chief. The chief is voiced by Maurice Lamarche. And he's a really fun. He makes the kids really funny, despite the fact that they are literally going to tear our main characters apart, use their parts for whatever they want, and then just leave them to die. That's a tricky role to pull off in a kid's movie, and I think he does it nicely. Sadly, there is one voice actress I don't think works that well. The chief of Clunker Island has a daughter. Her name is Carlotta. She's voiced by Portia Williams, and her voice is just annoying. Um, it sounds a bit to me like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Like, I'm not kidding. Her voice sounds very much like that to me. Specifically the character of Snow White in Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And it doesn't suit the character. It doesn't fit the movie. It doesn't make the emotional connection it needs to. It did not work for me. She has a song and, well the song's lyrics and instrumentation might be perfectly fine. The song's kind of grating because I just don't like listening to her voice. If you can, if you like her voice, then you'll probably not have an issue there uh, like I do. Uh, those sections of the movie will work stronger for you. As it's a musical, the accompanying score needs to be really good, so the Asylum brought in its two Chrissies, Chris Kano and Chris Reidenhauer. You've heard me praise both of them together and separately in other reviews. This is no exception. The non singing score is excellent. Strong, very uh, adventure oriented when need be, like during the races or when they're crossing a rickety bridge. Uh, there's a nice kind of horror element to the score that's a lot of fun and it works really well. The editing was by Colleen Hal Halsey and Amber Salinas and as mentioned earlier there are a few moments that are awkwardly edited, but for the most part, I think that's due to the limitations of making such a huge world, and this is the biggest world I've seen them, animated-wise, I've seen them make so far. In terms of that kind of thing, it feels kind of lived in, and it looks expansive, and there are multiple islands and multiple locations, uh, so I feel like it's always just limitations for not being able to process stuff, so you have to cut around before, you know, the computer haywires itself or whatever. Um, but there are two sequences, one right after the first song, we're introduced to Cargo, and then we cut uh, to Danny uh, in class, we're talking to Vin, and it's a really weird cut, it, it doesn't feel natural. Um, it just kind of jars you, oh, this is the new scene now. Uh, then there's a cut that involves the, the spirit of the Lost Woods, which is just an old truck with a tree growing out of its back. This movie's weird, guys. <laughs> Have I made that clear? When Abigail and Danny are leaving, it... I feel like we're missing a scene? Um... They're just back on the main road? Did I blink and miss something? I'm honestly not sure, but that's how it feels. Uh, I'm sorry those two things, but the editing's really good. Uh, the races feel very lively and energetic. 
helped on by the direction and score, of course. And uh, again, better than expected animation. And uh, I just I, I, in a musical, you need to find a rhythm to keep the music and everything amped and energetic. And uh, and I think they do that quite nicely. You've heard me be surprised at how much I like the animation in the film, and that's because it is detailed. It doesn't look, it is not on par with uh, anything by Pixar. It's not on par with even films I hated that came out last year, like Sausage Party, which was also technically independently produced. But if the rumors are to be believed, the studios produced it, forced overtime on these people, failed to compensate them for things, and then did not give them benefits like sick leave. Uh, so, bear that in mind. I don't know, I don't feel like that would happen here, but, you know, uh, so there will be a difference there. The animation department consisted of Derek Bray, Yolando Charlo Rodriguez, Lisa Marie Erickson, George Takori, Antonio Aquilino, Medina, and Paul Runyon. And yeah, the animation is solid. I like the color schemes on the cars. I like the lighting quite a bit. There's a decent amount of textures to them and to the shadows that are happening. The roads and the buildings don't look very detailed whatsoever. But our main focus of each scene do, and the strong lighting in the film helps overcome that. And there's a really amusing thing when our characters are sent to the juvenile detention hall. Everybody gets painted orange. And it's just a weird small quirk that I find really funny. Uh, then when they escape, they're no longer orange. And I'm just going to go with it. I'm not going to ask how that happens. Because I don't care. Cargo is the Asylum's third animated movie. As I've already mentioned. It's the most impressively animated movie. It's co-written by the director and by his dad and that dad is the dude who helped bring Peaky and the Brain into the world and is a musical about cars going to Clunker Island to stop cannibal cars cannibalizing other cars. What more do you need to know? There might be a few small flaws but who cares? This movie is energetic and insane and fun and if they're gonna keep if the assignment's gonna keep doing animated movies I hope they keep this trend up because this looks pretty good not flawless but pretty good and it's got a strong voice cast all able to bring out the best possible performances into their characters with one exception so yeah kids will like it adults will be fascinated by it this is easily their strongest animated movie and I hope wholeheartedly recommend everybody checking out Cargo as soon as possible. I said it early on and I'll say it again, it's hypnotically strange in the best, most glorious possible way that it can be. As always, I've been your host Bobby. Thank you for watching this very special Seeking Asylum review. I do hope you check out the film. It's unlike anything you'll ever see. We'll be back on Friday, continuing with Dragon Kong Countdown. I'll see you then.